Welcome to the next podcast of Millinery.info and thank you for joining us today. This next podcast is with textile artist and milliner Bridget Bailey. We hope you enjoy. Thank you for having me in your wonderful flight studio today, Bridget. I just thought we'd start with what you get up to in here and you know your textiles and your millinery and what you do. Goodness, everything in here really. I've got a dyeing area over there. You can see how tidy it is. <laughs> I do quite a lot of painting work on this table. I trained in textiles, so I think my millinery is always quite near the dye pot, if that makes sense. I think my kind of approach to dyeing is a sort of textile one, not a millinery one. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really happy with what I can buy. I want to change it. I want to ombre colours and sometimes I want to match nature. I might want to match a rose to a thundercloud. You've got to trick yourself away from pink or green. A lot of that goes on in here. And it's fantastic daylight, which I really need that for colour matching, sewing, fiddly work. Absolutely. And what, what mostly do you make pieces for? Are they for exhibitions or a client base? Because I've been doing it such a long time, I've managed to kind of manoeuvre my way to saying, this is what I make, I hope you love it. It's taken me 30 years to get there, but that's where I am now. Yes. So I'll make a piece and people will see it and they might well, if I'm lucky enough, just fall in love with it exactly as it is, or they might tweak the colour a tiny bit, or I might make for an exhibition a really special exhibition where I think, I don't mind if this sells, but I'm going to show them what I can do or make the idea just that bit more mad. That's really important to me now. Yes. Clever techniques aren't enough. My piece has got to say something a little bit particular in the kind of what it actually is, some sort of witticism or comment on something, and how it's made has got to be a bit clever too. All those boxes have got to be ticked. So. I know all milliners have the same problems, but it's really choosing the right exhibition where all their effort is worth it. Because you can be making all that effort to nowhere. We all do it, but it's kind of getting all, it's like an eclipse of the sun lining up, getting everything right, and then it's worth it, we do it, and it works. But, you know, that's quite a manoeuvre, to be honest, that whole thing. And with those exhibitions that you take part in, are they something you have a collection of galleries you frequently work with, or it's just as they come up? Uh, I do some really special ones, but actually, they're like a wonderful list of one night stands. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're not the, you were lovely, let's meet again, they're you were lovely, bye. <laughs> so it might be, I don't know, it might be some exhibition about tea at Fortnum and Mason's where I could make mad tea party hats. I did get um, commissioned to make a millinery version of a tea cosy. That was <laughs> such a lovely thing. So I had a lot of um, bees and flowers and steam sort of whooshing out of the spout of the teapot in a totally unwearable, unpourable way. <laughs> but, you know, those things are wonderful. But that sort of thing, or something really special with a group I sometimes show with at the Royal Academy, something at the V&A sometimes. It's really, it's here and there. And I think it's always having an ear open for the right opportunity because really special one-off things, you can't be making them every five minutes, so you've got to be picking, looking. People know about me, curators know about me. It's a kind of, it looks like things pop out of nowhere, but you're always on the lookout. Absolutely. And always half making special things so that you've got something that sort of, is kind of not totally from scratch. I think ideas, clever ideas, lurk for years for the right place to pop out. Will you start a piece from beginning to end or you'll have things partly made? But the, the actual they thing come... won't be partly made, yes. but the idea will be half-baked. So there might be a kind of... I've got boxes of examples of things. I'm... Okay, what should we get out? Now, here's a box of kind of half-baked flower making. So I might kind of, that's a way of making a lily where the petals are kind of embossed and wired and scrolled. And this one, I was doing an experiment of how to add a leaf along the stem. And because I don't want, it's wrapped with thread, 
I don't want a thin stem above where the spine of the leaf goes in. So you have to kind of really make all the wires match up and that means you're wrapping something oval is incredibly annoying instead of wrapping thread on something round. So I'm not very good at seeing round the problems. I have an idea in my head that just sparkles and says I'm going to be wonderful. But then I have to get right down to doing it and then I think, oh, bugger. The practicality. That's horrible. Yeah, so it's a constant kind of swapping through these different channels of the ideas lovely but how's the making going to work and a constant sort of dipping between the things so one part of the process doesn't get left behind how you cut the petals you can really kind of cut them very deep so you get the kind of swoop that would fill the airspace when it's away from the head but then this sort of petal that's not going to tangle in the hair because it's all tucked up underneath all these little things it's important to kind of have examples of them or I might want to make a petal that's a little bit x-ray where the wires are kind of more important than the fabric. Multi wires make multi curls in the petal. So all these things, if, I'm work if I want to plan an idea, I'll get a few of these out and think, what do I think of you? Or if a customer comes in, I'll say, well, look, this is how that works. What do you think of that? And then we'll work, they're sort of like tools I suppose mm, but yeah. drawings don't work for me because I cheat with them I really <laughs> need to go 3D immediately <laughs> so you work, you don't sketch anything in a kind of doodling way to remind myself yeah because it's easier than writing you know where the bit swoops down and goes across the so-and-so it's hard work <laughs> writing that down yeah. you can just draw a little bush but apart from that yeah and, and also seeing what sort of wire how bendy it goes when it gets big all these things are kind of engineering things not you know what I mean and it's problem solving yes, as you're going along. Yeah. Absolutely. So I might end up with loads of fistfuls of wire just to see how dangly it's going to be when it's two feet long or whether I really can wrap two metres of wire, you know, what that's actually like. Mm -hmm. So I don't get trapped into saying I could do something I can't. <laughs> Sometimes I have to name my pieces and describe them yes. before I've made them for an exhibition. And then um, a picture of a straw, parasitical straw spoon there. Yes. I said I was going to do that for Fortnum and Mason's. But then I just nearly cried. I could hardly make it work. I did four and put them in the bin before I got one to work. But I just thought, I want to block a spoon. I will block a spoon. It would just be so witty if that's all that's left of a hat. But it was such a panic. I actually felt sick. Oh, no. It worked out in the end. <laughs> but you, and then at that stage, you provided this descriptor to the store yeah, I had to for do the, the display. description and then do it, yeah. <laughs> Thinking Somewhat inversely. Yeah, then. yeah. Because turnarounds are quite quick, quicker than real making resolving yes absolutely and how how long do you get for the lead times on a project such as the spoon well it might be a couple of months and it's not long so sometimes i can't do the thing i generally have to have lots of special things to sort of resolved enough to know i could with a little bit of could i otherwise it's not interesting yes. and i've kind of set myself to be for myself as much as anyone else to be someone who is kind of what is she going to do next? What torture is she going to invent for herself next? So I have to do it now, and that sort of you have to step up to the plate and gives you, gives yourself a bit of a, cha yeah, a challenge. Absolutely, every time. because I made so many things, you know, so, for so long. You kind of I don't know. I need a sense of achievement. Yes. So can we jump back to the beginning? Yeah, you yeah, mentioned you studied textile design. Um, how did you get involved in that? Was it something that you studied straight out of school, or how did you become interested in textiles? I come from quite an arty family where my mum did drawing and painting and etching and my sister is a potter. And I always loved the arts, but I didn't want to do what they did. You know, I discovered textiles on a foundation course. It's the kind of course you do to have a little bite out of everything and see what you like. And when I saw textiles, although I'd be wearing clothes all my life, obviously, I hadn't quite realised textiles was a thing. And the kind of colour and the way you could dye things and the textures of fabrics and the sort of iridescence of them, they're just beautiful anyway. That really attracted me. And I studied weaving and printed textiles. So it's wonderful to have studied it, but weaving did nearly kill me, actually. So <laughs> weaving had not. <laughs> but it's wonderful to know it yes. a little bit. I actually ended up specialising in pleated fabrics, so it sort of had a bit of 3D about it, but not totally. And kind of where you could make fabrics move and change that's such a thing in my work even now it's a bit of fabric manipulation understanding what they'll do and um, 
yeah, I, I took off from there really. And I was a textile pleater for the first sort of five or six years of my career. That's what I did. And then I took my fabrics to show the designer Jean Muir, thinking I might maybe I'd make some garment details or something for her. And she said, make me some hats. <laughs> so I began. That was in 1984. So kind of absolutely in at the deep end without a clue about what a hat elastic was or anything. But I just in my own way, made these quite sculptural headpiece kind of things using my fabrics. I made these, they were kind of, sometimes they were hats, sometimes there might be a collar or, mm. and, and this kind of thing where you'd pleat and kind of sculpt with fabric and pick out the edges of the pleat with a colour. I love that sort of, it's like enhancing it really, isn't it? It's sort of quite graphic. So those sort of things for her. Did that for yeah. about five years, all different ones. And were you still working with the um, the pleaters at the time, or you've got? I did it all myself. It's oh, all yes. done by hand with an iron <laughs> or in a paper mould. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are wonderful commercial pleaters, but I think it's quite important. Was even then it was important. Look at what they do, and if I'm going to do something by hand, what can I do to make it different? And the reason for me to do it. So you know, so much whether you resolve it and join the edges to make that little twist over. You know, that's something the pleaters wouldn't do, but it's something I could do. So yeah. kind of always measuring yourself so that what work you put in makes a difference. That's even more like that today, isn't it? Absolutely. And from the fabric pleating hats, how did you become involved with the use of more like traditional milling materials at the moment, like you use cinema and things? So um, I did some training with Rose Corey, but formed um, Bailey Tomlin in... 1989 with my lovely friend and business partner Anne Tomlin and she had a, a more millinery sort of training and I had a more textile training but we sort of complemented each other and I kind of learned a bit like day release I learned with Rose Corey at the same time as being in business and things kind of grow and I think it was quite you know maybe it's not the usual path but what's that awful phrase necessity is the mother of invention <laughs> you know you just manage yes. so I kind of learned as I went along and and by the time you've been in business for a while however you learned you've evolved as you went along we all do that don't we every single milliner probably has their own way of blocking and their own way of finishing an edge or it sort of evolves what was the most valuable thing you got out of your training with Rose when you were learning in that way it's taken I think these trainings they're very intense at the time, but actually they're also slow release, if that makes sense. Yes. So really honestly, looking back on it now, I think one of the things that really, really impressed me about Rose, over my own teaching or many other people's, is that she could come at a problem with real skill, not just in one way, but she'd sort of be able to think, okay, how can we tackle this then? Instead of saying a sort of, you block that way, and once it hasn't worked, we're sort of off the road. I think within her teaching, this is what impresses me so much now, within her teaching, she could be very inventive and very calm and not stressed out. She could sort of troubleshoot all sorts of things, but from a kind of couture level, instead of from a hacker's level, which you could feel like once you get off your tram line of... Um, refinement you could sort of be like a five-year-old she was never like that so that kind of attitude the older I get the more that stands out to me actually I mean she just knew special ways about everything and even when she didn't know them she had a sort of couture wonderful approach that was right in her it's anyway I don't know if that makes sense no, that does that does absolutely you also teach as well what are some of the things that you like to share with your students I think um, the kind of way that I roll edges, it's a very physical thing. It's not, we have to do a lot of rambling on about it, but it's a very sort of touch kind of thing. So I think one of the things I find really interesting is what you can say, a bit like a physiotherapist or a speech therapist or something. How could you make the cinema do that by moving your hand in a particular way? And to be able to say, Press like that and twist it like that a little bit. Slow down a bit. Try it that way. Okay. Just 
calm down and let's start that again. When someone gets it after these funny little prompts and they actually do it and you see their face light up, it's just magic really. To give them, it is not so much about them copying what I'm doing like a parrot, sometimes you have to do that, but I think to really get down to communicating with people so that some little quirky thing you do with your hands to make something, they can do that too. I find that really interesting. Absolutely. Fascinating actually. And how has your process changed as you've been creating since when you first began to how you create a piece now? Kind of sadly, it's actually got harder and harder and harder and I expect it's the same for everybody because I, I've got so much more fussy about how I want things to look and what I want things to do and right from the idea to the finish on things I want everything to be maybe the best I've ever done. Of course it doesn't happen like that, but that fussiness and hoping for to surprise myself, that's there in everything. So, you know, we used to do a lot of hats the same, so there'd be a sort of sense of achievement of doing a thousand things the same sometimes if you're making a trim or something, and the kind of fitness you get from that. But now I want every single piece I make to be the next generation from the one before, saying something different, be a natural progression from something. It's a tall order, but that's what interests me. So it's got a lot harder, really. Everything has. <laughs> and self-imposed as well. <laughs> yeah, completely, completely. And what materials do you most enjoy working with at the moment? Oh, goodness. I think I've got a little bit of a buffet approach in a way, but I think what I do love you know, there's wonderful things people do, amazing things with plastic or you know, really clever things that are wonderful and sophisticated. But I think what I enjoy is making cinema do something else. And maybe parasitical straw could roll a little bit thinner or curve a little bit more, dig something a bit deeper out of it. Or maybe I could cut an edge of fabric even finer and it still won't fray. So I suppose refining some fairly traditional things. I think I love that. It's like speaking in a language that you know instead of suddenly learning Russian with a, a new fabric. I'm kind of <laughs> speaking, you know what I mean? A bit more refining. I think yeah. I really enjoy that. Still using the same materials, but exploring and, them in a different And really, way. things I know quite well, but kind of pushing them a bit harder. Mm -hmm. And you're also known for your beautiful <laughs> fine work, but also using some unusual materials. For example, in Craft Week, you used whiskers um, on a yes. fly. Ah, that's a whole <laughs> other. Thank you for reminding me about that. <laughs> A whole other thread of my life that's sort of always been there but has only recently kind of really popped into the frame is this sort of hoarding, collecting, beach combing, foraging. It's sort of, I've always done that as a kid. I collected things on the beach. You know, everyone loves that, don't they? We've all got an instinct. But it's taken me 30 years to kind of suddenly weave that into my work. So now, if you look over there, those butterflies. They got a bit of macaw feather kind of crushed and fused onto their wings. That actually my mum collected the feather from one of her friends who had a macaw. It sat in a drawer for ten years, then suddenly it squashed onto a wing. I'm just gonna show you one of my yes. collection trays. I had to make a special exhibition, one woman exhibition that showed how I work. So that box is how real life is, where everything's in a heap. But in my mind, this is how it is in my mind where I think, OK, I've got the cat's whiskers, I've got those special parrot feathers from Australia that I posted back to myself, I've got the little pheasant pinions, partridge feathers bleached, those are from a peacock, those are from my mum's bronze turkey and I've sort of pulled them under a bit of stiffener till they're sort of crispy like a beetle's wing case. Yes. Peacock thread. So all these little ingredients are kind of there, ready to use, and they're not things you could buy. And often, if you want a left and right feather, you have to collect them. Mm -hmm. So these little hordes, I just have them at the ready. And now, if I want to make a cat's whisker and ten eye on a wasp, I've got the whiskers ready. I've got loads more whiskers than this. I've probably got about a hundred because now people collect them for me. And sometimes I get a little hoard in the post. <laughs> it's just honestly, it's so lovely. Or a tuft of squirrel fur that someone thinks I might use, or just weird little things that, what's it called? I'm calling it crowd, crowd collect. And this tray here is, these are all the outtakes of thinking, 
could you make a sort of x-ray abdomen out of cinema that's hollow or how could you make some things I was making a very spooky insect I was making a tick because it's something people hate and it's not all about butterflies you've got to kind of have a bit of contrast and I thought I could make its mandibles by covering beads in velvet but it just looked like a teddy bear's mandibles it just looked ridiculous <laughs> so that's just stuck in there as a kind of not today thank you um, you might be helpful for yeah, something else it later might be. <laughs> this is a I was going to make a flea, but its legs were so difficult that I made one set of legs and gave up. Thinking about um, a stag beetle's antlers, but sort of in a sort of out of focus way, or something's leg with the different joints. It's kind of, it sounds ridiculous, but it's like 20 years of experiments spanning this thing. And if you don't try, you don't know. So these knowings, that's the kind of physical example of thinking, that's what that does. That's what that does. That could be interesting, but the chiffon's a bit frail, so it actually frays when you shove it over the end of the bead. You know, these little things are my knowings yes. that you carry with you. And do you keep all the knowings, or is there a sort of point when you're like, no, you're not going to be helpful, you're gonna, we're going to say goodbye? <laughs> I find it quite hard to, actually, because the trouble is, I'm such a sort of dip in here, or forage back there, or... You never know what you're going to want when. I start to kind of span my whole life in experimenting and thinking I'm going to go right back to that, you know. So it's quite hard, but luckily my work's quite small. I don't know what big sculptors are doing. <laughs> Crying, probably. <laughs> and how long have you been in this space? Clockwork Clock, Clock Studios? Yeah. Yes. been in this building since 1986, but upstairs through all the special Bailey Tomlin years, we sort of trickled down like water into this bit, which is absolutely perfect. Although it's a bit boiling in the summer and a bit freezing in the wind, it's kind of a perfect place to, to kind of be part of everyone, but in your own corner, you know. It's some a beautiful, the, like, a, like a beautiful glass house. Some of these sort of workings, if anyone even comes in, I can't stand it. You know, you're desperate for company one minute saying, what do you think of this? But then you need to be alone. Seems like the perfect balance. Yeah, here. it is. It is. And who else? What other um, artists are in this space? There's um, a textile artist next door whose work I love. And there's ceramics people, there's a sculptor upstairs, other textile people. It's quite a lovely community if everyone's a little bit different. And sometimes we collaborate, but I think we're a bit of a kind of... You know, as you were saying about the milliners, it's quite isolating being a self-employed maker. So company is essential. You know, it's you need to have your own kind around you, don't you? Absolutely. But not too much. Do you have a favourite piece that you've created? At this particular moment or over all time? So it's kind of an annoying answer, but I do have a bit of the best pieces can't answer it in a sensible way. That's okay. The best pieces are the ones that are just welling up to be made. And then when they're born, I have a bit of sort of post make or depression because it wasn't quite as wonderful as I thought. Yes. But then the next one, I'm honestly just, it's like a sort of mirage that you just think, okay, I'm really going to do it now. I mean, there's, there's situations that work well, like the Fortnum and Mason's, um, exhibition where I could make that tea cosy, mad millinery tea cosy, but also some tipping teacups and spoonfuls of sugar pouring down faces. You know that, I think the really special thing is when the venue, the type of exhibition it is, and the pieces, when everything matches up, and unfortunately that isn't all about me because I can't make that happen on my own, but those are the most magic things, and the special work is, I'm a hard taskmaster, I expect we all are, you know, but I'm not easily satisfied with my work. And I think that's what makes it what it is. You know, after all this time, being very dissatisfied, but also hopeful. Does that make sense? Yes. God, I give this a hard time. <laughs> but that's what makes it interesting. You know, I don't, I've done lots of repetitive work and now I need a challenge. And what's, what's your next project? What's, what's in the works at the moment? I'm doing an exhibition called May London Marylebone in October. And I'm going to do some artwork type things for that. Absolutely love millinery, but sometimes I want to use the language of millinery to make a sculpture, if that makes sense. So I might do some of that, you know, the kind of 
whether I make a special pea pod where the peas are covered in feathers or some collection of scrolling beans. I was looking at a bean that I picked where it kind of curled all the way around like that Fibonacci curl. You know, there's some wonderful things going on. And sometimes, you know, millinery, textiles is full of colour and texture, but millinery is full of wonderful lines. So things that I might be speaking in textiles and millinery, but I might be making a sculpture, that's um, where I'm going to be doing it. Thank you for joining us for this podcast from millinery.info. If you happen to be in London between the 18th and 21st of October 2018, make sure you check out Bridget's exhibition at Made London Marilyn Bone. We'd like to thank our supporters for this podcast, Catherine Ellen of The Essential Hat and Louise McDonald Millinery. If you'd like to become a supporter of this podcast, check out our Patreon link. There are two options. You can simply support this podcast, or if you'd like to have your business name mentioned, there's a second tier in which you can select. We hope you'll consider supporting this podcast so we can bring you more fabulous content. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to bringing you more discussion on hats soon.